OK, let's get started. Um, welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to uh, see so many people coming in, and I'm sure there'll be uh, some more over the course of this uh, introduction. Um, happy to kick this webinar off. Welcome to the webinar, Unleashing the Power of Process Mining on Formula One. Um, I'm very excited to tell you all about it. I will uh, yeah, introduce myself in a bit. I'll introduce Apolix, but also yeah, a little bit about the reason how we came to actually doing this with Formula One data. Um, trust me, it's going to be an exciting one. There is going to be exciting insights there as well. So uh, yeah, hope you're looking forward to it. Uh, let's get started. Um, first of all, if you have watched Formula One in the past one or two years, I'm sure you've seen uh, such a graphic. Um, so I have a first question for you. Who is recognizing exactly these graphics? Can you maybe raise hands if you uh, do? Look at that. Okay, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, happy to hear that people do recognize this. Uh, good to hear. Um, and this is exactly what we're going to talk about. Because did you know that Formula One ca ca cars generate over 1,000 gigabytes of data per race weekend? And did you also know that a lot of or a part of that data, the car sensor data, is actually publicly available? And that the car center data is actually used by Formula One teams to analyze their competition. Because of course, from their own cars, they retrieve a lot of a lot of data, um, but some data, of course, they don't share with other teams. So they rely on publicly available data to actually start understanding their competition. And it's exactly the data that we see right here, because this data is used a lot to uh, enhance the broadcast, to explain what is happening. You can see, for example, the throttle, you can see DRS. So it just explains a bit more context um, about what we see. And that data is actually available publicly. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So I hope you're excited um, because we're going to introduce also the topic of process mining to you. Uh, I've seen a lot of uh, some customers, I'm seeing colleagues, I'm seeing people I know in this webinar, but also a lot of people I don't know. I also assume that uh, you are either here to learn about process mining itself or you're already aware about what process mining is and you're here to yeah, understand more about Formula One data. So it's it's your lucky day. We're doing both today. So um, I'm happy to have you here. But also, there is more behind what we're doing today because the example we're walking through is very, yeah, let's call it specific. Um, but also looking at the audience, we have students here, we have professionals here. Uh, there's an underlying theme, and that is how to extract value from data. And uh, what do you do that through? Uh, Pros mining machine learning, uh, just visualization, it's all possible. Um, and it's a very good skill to possess. So that's also yeah, the, the angle we're taking here is how do you actually do that? How do you take any data set? How do you transform it in the way it will yeah, give you the results you're looking for and actually find value from there? So um, yeah, that, that, that is also the purpose. So really, any data set can be turned into something valuable. And that is, uh, yeah, hopefully what you'll take away as a learning from today as well. Um, before we dive into everything, I first would like to introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm Jasper. I'm uh, working at Apolix. I'll also introduce Apolix in a bit. Um, and I'm a big Formula One enthusiast. To give a quick uh, introduction, uh, I've been, uh, uh, for example, two years ago, I was still a student. Actually, I was living in Rome, uh, an exchange student, and I'm not sure if anyone has been on an exchange, but you don't spend a lot of time studying. So I had a lot of time on my hands there. And also, again, being a Formula One enthusiast, I'm a data enthusiast, uh, I wanted to do something with it. And I actually discovered that the data that we just talked about was publicly available. So I was watching every race, of course, and then I found out that there's actually publicly available data that explains a lot. So I started spending time on you know, with Python, with the, the data sets to yeah, discover what is possible, what we see there. And uh, it was actually quite cool. So I started working with that data. Um, and what I did, I started also knowledge sharing. Uh, what I, for example, did started writing articles on medium.com. I'm not sure 
if you're familiar with the website, it is a uh, blogging platform in which a lot of knowledge is shared around a lot of data science uh, uh, subjects. So I started creating tutorials there, uh, for example, how to do for one data analysis with Python. And actually it's uh, yeah, gotten quite popular. Uh, it has had uh, over 50,000 readers so far. So I'm quite yeah, proud of that. And um, yeah, this also underlines my, yeah, my passion for the subject. And also next to that, I've started a, um, a Twitter account where I share these best practices. I share insights, uh, for example, uh, yeah, what did you see during the last race? Where was the difference made during quality? Also there, uh, having over 10K followers nowadays, so it's uh, going quite well. And on the side, I've been collaborating with a lot of um, yeah, people also from the Formula One industry. We're currently in the content creation business. I'm not sure if Blake is here, but uh, hi, Blake. Um, and it has been an exciting journey so far. So I'm uh, very happy to share also what I'm doing as a hobby with my professional life at Apolix. Uh, I'd also like to quickly introduce Apolix uh, because we are a process mining consultancy focused on Solonis. So that means that we have a lot of knowledge around what Solonis is, what process mining is, and we actually leverage the capabilities of process mining to accelerate strategic initiatives within organizations. Um, and I think here very important to realize is that um, no matter how fancy and technical a, a bit of analysis or a tool can be, uh, to actually drive change, to actually improve processes, you need a lot more than only technical excellence. You need to be strategically um, yeah, capable of positioning your tool and you need to understand the value it brings. You need to really understand that what you do in the technical bit also drives change and impact in yeah, the business or the, the process you're talking about. So uh, that is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And we're a Solonis Platinum partner. Uh, and what Solonis is, it's the market leader for gross mining, but I'll show you that later as well. So that's me, and that is um, Apolix. Then Formula One data, that's what we're essentially here for, right? So what do we have? What does it look like? What can we do with it? Uh, I'm going to go a bit more in detail yeah, what exactly we have available. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Formula One TV. That's basically the online platform through which uh, Formula One streams its own uh, yeah, races. And that Formula One TV has an API that has a lot of data available for us. So you can think about results data. So who finished where during which session. So for FP1, two, three, the data is all there. We also have lab data, so each lab that was completed, how fast was it, what were the sector times, what was the speed, what compound was the lab done on, etc. We also have uh, information about the event, what was the weather, uh, when was it, for example. Like There's a lot of information available. And the lab data, that's the thing we're mostly interested in, because let's say we see that lab, lab one from the driver was slower than his second lab. Or, for example, as we saw last weekend, uh, Alonso looked to get the pole position, but actually Verstappen got it. So we really understand, really, really want to understand what is happening within such a lab. And this is where the car sensor data comes in. So for each and every lab that has been completed during a, a race or a session, we can get all the car sensor data. And that is quite cool. Because we can, can think about is how fast was the car going? How deep was the throttle pressed in? Is it 0%, 50%, 60%, 100%? It's all similar, uh, all available. Was the brake being applied, yes or no? Uh, how many RPM even was the engine running? So uh, yeah, how fast was the engine running? The RS, is it open, yes or no? But also very cool, where exactly on the track was the car? We have the X and Y coordinates of each data point. So just imagine being a student who is uh, having a lot of time on his hand, a big data and from one enthusiast, and then discovering that actually all this data is available. That was for me quite the, the interesting moment, and, and that's also why I'm here happily explaining that to you. So this car sensor data is what we will use in the analysis we're gonna do today. 
Um, but before you go into process mining and, and, and a lot of things that really apply specifically to what uh, the data can do, uh, this is just a few examples of what the telemetry data, so the car sensor data can do with us. And uh, what you see here is, for example, a track map because we have the X and Y coordinates. Here you see a telemetry overlay, and here you see a race pace analysis. Uh, we see corner analysis. I'm not sure if you've seen the AWS corner analysis graphics, but you can actually recreate those with Python. Uh, race strategy analysis. And these are all things that I've been creating over the past years and uh, also writing tutorials about. So uh, I'll also be sure to send the reference materials, also the tutorials later after this webinar. So you can maybe check them out as well. And uh, yeah, maybe even create your own analysis in Python. So this is just examples of what the data can do for us. But um, let's dive into an example. Uh, let's start understanding what we can learn from the Monaco Grand Prix qualifying. And before we do that, some hands maybe for who watched last weekend's uh, Grand Prix. Look at that. Okay, that's, uh, that's a lot of people. Happy to hear as well, because this is exactly what we're going to dive into. Um, for the ones who haven't seen last weekend's Grand Prix, it was in Monaco, and Monaco is a very intense uh, street circuit. Uh, it's a lot of yeah, walls very close to the circuit, just zero margin for error. And it was a very intense qualifying session because during the qualifying session, cars yeah, try to set the fastest lap as possible. And if you're the fastest lap, you can start from the front. And um, Fernando Alonso, the two-time world champion who's currently, yeah, back in his top form, as we might be able to say, uh, he's actually challenging for this pole position or for his first win in a while. Uh, and people are actually a little bit hoping that he'll get it as well. Um, and it looked like he would get his pole position. He had set the fastest lap, Verstappen set the second fastest lap and was actually uh, looked to be on the back foot. And at the very last second of the qualifying, then um, yeah, Verstappen still managed to get that pole position in the last few corners away from Alonso. It was a very, very intense uh, qualifying session, very, uh, very exciting as well. Uh, and it's very cool to then understand with data what exactly happened. And that's what we're going to do today. Um, before we do that, I would like to do a quick recap of exactly what we're talking about. Um, what we're going to watch is um, Max Verstappen's last two sectors. So yeah, the last bit of uh, of his pole position lap. And what we see here at the bottom is the green line from Alonso and the blue line from Verstappen. And as long as Verstappen's line is below the one from Alonso, it means that Alonso was faster uh, until that point of the lap. So is, uh, if they would cross like this to finish, then uh, Verstappen would be second, Alonso would be first. And you can exactly see where already the difference is being made. And I think it's good to mention that this is generated by uh, Formula One. It's based on their data, so not, not all on publicly available data. Uh, and we're going to see what we can do with our own data that we extract from the session to also confirm these insights and to apply pros mining on that. So let's start watching. We see here that, um, yeah, Verstappen is still a little bit on the back foot. Uh, Alonso is even faster through the following corner because yeah, the gap is increasing a little bit. And then here is where the difference starts to be made. Like Verstappen gets closer and closer to Alonso. And through this corner, actually, he gains so much momentum that he yeah, virtually overtakes Alonso to get pole position. And the difference was only 0 0.08 seconds. So these events basically describe where stuff made a difference. And that's what we currently have been able to see in, uh, in the timing data. But now we want to look at the own data, our own data, right? So what I did, I extracted the data, the telemetry data of this session, and uh, plotted a track map of this session. And um, what we did here is because we know the X and Y coordinates, and we also know the speed, I chopped the track up in 25 tiny pieces, um, calculate whether Verstappen or Alonso had the fastest speed in that section, and then colored it accordingly. 
So what you see is basically where the trick is green. It was Alonso was faster and blue is where Verstappen was faster. And all those events that we just saw in the video, for example, coming out of the tunnel, uh, Verstappen lost a little bit of time to Alonso, so it's green. Uh, here, Alonso is also slightly faster. And then in the end, coming out of the swimming pool section, we see over here, the track starts to turn blue. We see that from here on, it's only blue actually. And it really indicates that yeah, Verstappen had the, the overhand on uh, Alonso from there on. So yeah, it is of course something that people have seen in the timing data, the, the, the third sector of Verstappen was much faster, but now we actually know where that happened. Now we also wanna understand why and how exactly that is you know, being caused. And that is what we're going to dive into. Um, so yeah. We have not talked about process mining yet because now we share a lot of information about yeah, the, the Formula One data, about yeah, what is possible, but now we're going to apply process mining on that. I'm sure not everyone knows what process mining is, so of course I'll first give a quick introduction. And that is that process mining converts unused digital breadcrumbs into insights. And maybe we should start with the question, what is a process and a process can be anything literally everything you do or businesses do is a process and a good example that a colleague mentioned to me actually uh, is a morning routine you wake up your alarm goes off you turn your alarm off you get out of bed take a shower dry your hair um, get some breakfast brush your teeth and you go out that's let's say that's the happy path that is how you want your morning to go because that's the way you're out of your house in let's say 30 minutes However, the reality is, of course, that there's deviations and there's deviations everywhere. Um, sometimes your alarm doesn't go off. Sometimes your shower doesn't work. Your breakfast is empty. Just basically anything that causes processes to deviate from their blueprint. And it's also something we see in businesses a lot. Like there's business processes. And ideally, those processes flow as smoothly as possible. But in real reality, there's a lot of, yeah inefficiencies. There's side tracks that have, for example, manual changes, uh, delays, um, whatever that causes a process to be slow and efficient, in inefficient is what we uh, can understand with process mining because process mining collects all those activities that happen within a process from an IT system and is able to map those out for every individual flow through the process. And that's what I'm going to show you in a bit. Um, to make it a bit more technical, uh, basically process mining is based on cases and events. And a case can be a single flow through process. So think about a single morning, let's say this morning, and events are all activities that were related to what you did that particular morning. So when you start thinking about other examples, applying it on businesses, we're talking about invoices in accounts payable, for example. Those invoices are created, they're approved, and they're paid. There can be a lot happening in between, but those are the activities or the events you can think about. Or we talk about customer service ticket in Salesforce. It will be opened, it will be assigned to a queue, maybe reassigned, it will be closed. And that is, yeah, what process mining analyzes. So it's all about relating those events to cases and then understanding the process on an aggregate level. So how do we apply that to foreign one data? Because we see a lot of sensor data, but yeah, how, how do we make um, some insight? How do we get some insights from that? Um, so let's think about what would be our case. And a case would be a full lab in this sense. So a single lab, it can be for stop and spoil lab, can be Alonso's lab. Um, so one case is one lab. And we try to identify activities that describe those lab. So think about changes in the process, but also think about, first of all, starting a lab or completing a lab. Think about completing sector one or two or three, which is basically the end of the lab. Then we can go a bit more in depth. What if we see that the throttle, full throttle is applied? Or what if you see that the throttle is released? So the, 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 the throttle percentage goes from 100% to something else. Uh, that's a very interesting one. Uh, brake applied, brake release, we can identify that as well because we know 
for four or five times a second what is happening in that lab. So we see those changes, we have a timestamp, and then we can create an event log from that. When do you achieve your top speed? When do you achieve 100, 200, 300 kph? Those are all the types of events that we've been identifying within a, uh, a lab here. So uh, you might be wondering what are what's the advantage advantage of looking at data with yeah, that angle because it's a quite a different angle, but it, it allows you to ask process mining questions, for example, that are all about hey, uh, what is the time between two activities, or is there any undesired activity in this process? Um, so think about, for example, what's the average time between applying the brake and going full throttle? So when you apply the brake when the car starts decelerating and then you go around the corner and it takes an X amount of time and then once the car is through the corner it can go full throttle again to accelerate it away and of course the goal of Formula 1 cars that's why the downforce is so important is to do it as quick as possible because corners uh, yeah take time so we can now start looking at those types of KPIs you can also Think about what's the time between applying the brake and releasing the brake. So how efficiently or how long is a car braking? Um, how long does it take to accelerate from 100 kph to 200 kph? So yeah, how much engine power do you have? Or maybe even how much traction does your car have? Or how long does it take to accelerate from applying full throttle to achieving the top speed? Also engine power and traction. So I hope you're getting what I'm uh, referring to, um, you can now yeah, calculate different types of questions with this type of data. And that's exactly what we're going to do in the demo. Um, but before we go to the demo, I think it's a good opportunity to uh, maybe see if there's any questions. So you can raise your hand or you can also ask, ask them in the chat. I'll wait a few seconds to see if people are typing maybe and otherwise I continue. If you try to analyze data from another racing series like IndyCar, um, no, I haven't. Um, would be cool. Personally, I don't really follow uh, IndyCar. I'm not sure even what the data availability is there but i'm sure there there is some data which but i haven't uh, looked at it but uh, good question would be definitely interesting um and can you provide a link where the formula one tv api is available uh, definitely i'll make sure to remember that and set that as a follow-up um, there's a python library for it actually it's called fast f1 and that python library allows you to uh, communicate with the formula one tv api so uh I'll make sure to share the resources afterwards. Um, if there's no more questions, we're going to dive into a Salonis um, right here. And I'm going to show you exactly what we've been building, how we've been analyzing uh, the qualifying of the Monaco Grand Prix and what insights we get from there. And um, first and foremost, what we're looking at right now it's called Salonis, and I already quickly touched upon it. Salonis is the market leader for pros mining applications. It's, a, it's an execution management tool that actually allows you to continuously improve your processes with, for example, pros mining insights. There's a lot of dashboarding capabilities around it, so we can show KPIs, we can show like basically uh, everything related to a process. We can also explore the process, and that's what I'm going to show first. Um, what we see over here is the process explorer or the variant explorer to be more specific and um, this basically lets us understand how exactly a process is flowing of for example a business of a morning routine but also of a formula one lab and um, these are all the labs that were completed during the qualifying session we see there's 330 labs and this also involves for example in labs out labs. It can also be uh, labs that weren't the fastest. So that's why we see 330. And uh, 
yeah, those labs have different, of course, very different variants because you're not always going full throttle. Uh, sometimes you break very early because you're on a warm up lap anyway. So that's also where we can start understanding if we move towards, um, let me refresh, if we start adding more variants. So we can increase the complexity of what we see. We can add more variants together until we basically see everything that happened during this qualifying session. And uh, there's a lot of complexity here. Uh, you see a lot of different connections. It's really hard to make sense of what we're seeing here. Um, but this basically can also be your process, your business process. It can be your accounts payable process. It can be your order to cash process, where you see a lot of those unnecessary deviations. And um, this is the goal of the, the dashboards that we build around this is to make this spaghetti model comprehensive. Um, but let's focus on fastest labs for now. And you see that things become a bit cleaner. And uh, what I'll do here, I'll not play the full thing, but you can see how the process flows. So you go to turn one, break, uh, go full throttle again, achieve 200 kph, break again, uh, go on throttle again. And that's basically how a lap can flow. Um, of course, it goes very fast, so it's uh, hard to relate this to the Monaco track layout, but this is actually describing a single lab through Monaco. Um, and now we're here to make sense of that. So let's go back to the management dashboard. And uh, I want to show you some features of uh, Salonis, but also some insights of the data. And we start actually not with a pros mining insights, but we start analyzing telemetry. Because what we're here to do is we're here to analyze the lab of Verstappen and the lab of Fernando Alonso to see uh, where exactly the difference was made. So what I will do, I'll go here, I select Verstappen, and I select Alonso. And what we then see is the telemetry overlay of the full lab. So on the x-axis, you see the distance. And on the y-axis, you see yeah, the, the sensor data for different aspects. So we see the speed, for example, we see the throttle input, brake, and the gear. And the orange line is Alonso, and the blue line is Verstappen. So starting with sector one, we actually heard Verstappen say in the post quality interviews that he was a little bit conservative into turn one, that he took extra care. And that's exactly what we see in here because the blue line Verstappen into turn one goes off throttle much earlier than Alonso. And also when we look at the break, we see that uh, Verstappen breaks earlier than Alonso. What we even see is that it's actually true according to the data is that Alonso was breaking and applying throttle at the same time. So that's an interesting insight. I'd be wondering why exactly he's doing that. Maybe it has to do something with car rotation, or maybe it's just the sensor data showing a bit yeah, off data. But um, we see that, yeah, basically Alonso definitely won the first sector. Also, you see here, he's carrying much more speed through his corners. Uh, also here, he has a slight speed advantage. The orange line is a bit on top. So first sector, definitely Alonso. Second sector is rather similar. You see that they're breaking almost the same time. Sometimes Alonso is a bit longer, uh, shorter on the break, never stop. Uh, also here we see that. So also here we see that Alonso is having much more speed. He's carrying much more speed through the corners than for stop. So uh, really those first two sectors, they were Alonso's. And uh, yeah, it actually all came down to the third sector. So here is where we start seeing actually things turning around a lot because now you see that the blue line here is actually carrying for example much more throttle through the uh, swimming pool she came um, it's also breaking a bit earlier but going off the break also earlier to accelerate as fast as possible out of that last corner where you here see this is the last corner this is where we saw that Verstappen actually gained that advantage over Alonso I see that he's getting so much more speed so much earlier in the lab, really allowing him to compensate for those multiple tents that he lost over the first two sectors. So this is really very interesting because now we see what, uh, where exactly the difference was made. But we also want to even better or even differently compare uh, how that went. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to go to our benchmarking sheet. And benchmarking is a very powerful feature of Salonis because 
the, we have a lot of contextual data available. So you can also compare two different process flows with each other to see, yeah, in what sense they're actually different. So what we're going to do now is we're going to compare drivers, but it can also be here, for example, compare business units or departments or anything you want to compare in your business process. So you can uh, compare customers, you can compare product groups, material groups, uh, anything you can compare with this feature and really allows you to spot differences and identify inefficiencies quite quickly. So what we're going to do here, uh, we're going to select the driver. Let's uh, first of all, uh, first up on. And then here we're going to select Alonso. And then we'll be seeing, yeah, different KPIs and also the, the throughput time pro mining KPIs uh, that we talked about. Mm. First of all, we see that the lap time of Verstappen was 11.365 um, and if Alonso was uh, 11.449, so it's a 0.08 uh, second difference. And we can already understand from the, the aggregate KPIs where on average the difference was. So the, the, the top speed of Verstappen was 2 kph higher. The average speed was actually 4 kph higher. So on average, Verstappen managed to carry more speed throughout the entire lap. But now we start looking at, for example, how much percentage of the lap was the driver on throttle and how much percentage of the lap was the driver braking. And um, yeah, we're looking at Monaco. So this percentage is actually very, very low. 45% uh, is very low for a lap, but it's a street circuit. And here we see that actually full throttle, first up was 2% more on throttle, on full throttle than, uh, than Alonso. And also he was less time on the brake than Alonso. We can also zoom into those um, process mining KPIs here. So how much time, for example, is the driver on the brake? Uh, so what's the time between applying the brake and releasing the brake? Here we see it was 1.375 milliseconds. So 1.3 seconds, as, uh, yeah, exactly. And uh, for Alonso, we see it was 1.3 seconds as well, but just a little bit longer. So on average, Alonso was on the brake a little bit longer. Uh, looking at braking, brake released and going full throttle. So basically the cornering time. Now we're talking about uh, here 1600 milliseconds and here 1500 milliseconds, 1524 milliseconds. So here actually on average, Alonso was cornering faster than Verstappen. It's a sm small difference, but it is, it is actually over the entire lap, he was cornering faster. And also looking at acceleration between 100 and 200 kph, for Verstappen, it was 2.041 seconds, while for Alonso, it was 1.960 seconds. So also here, the acceleration between 100 and 200 kph, is for example, saying how much power you have, but also how much traction you have in your car, was for Alonso over the entire lap much better. But now again, let's start diving into sector one and sector two and sector three, because if we look at sector one, and we're going to only focus on the KPIs at the top here, we see that in sector one, actually Alonso was much longer on throttle. So 54% of the time Alonso was on throttle, while Verstappen only 46%. And that's exactly what we saw at the beginning, right? Uh, Alonso getting off the brake, uh, sorry, uh, going much faster through turn one, much stuff being a bit conservative. That's exactly what you see in this KPI for sector one as well. Um, but also breaking, um, yeah, a little bit less actually. So let's go to sector two. And here we see uh, already a big difference. Actually, interesting to see how Alonso was faster for sector two, but was less time on throttle. This is a very interesting insight, but now we're going to dive into sector three. And here we see actually huge differences the other way around. So you see that the full throttle, the time of full throttle was 47% for a stop -in. Well, 44% for uh, Alonso. Average speed was higher. Uh, the top speed was a little bit higher as well. So this is exactly again where uh, the difference was made. And what we can even do, we can zoom with our process explorer into the sector three. So we see here is if you only look at sector three and we compare it, so you see that sector two was completed, the throttle was released afterwards, and then a lot of different things started happening. Um, 
So here we see that it's all mostly rounded to full seconds, but we also see some differences. For example, uh, going at the end here from full throttle to 200 kph, and here from full throttle to 200 kph, you see that it's actually, it also took rounded off into two seconds. Well, for Verstappen, it was uh, yeah, a bit quicker, only one second. So uh, this again, the acceleration in the end where you saw that Verstappen managed to go on throttle so much earlier and actually there gained the big difference over Alonso. And again, it's also something we can then see in our event log. So our activity table, where you see all the activities that happened within the process. Um, it's a bit much information, but what we're seeing here is all the activities. So this is basically the basis for the process explorer that we just looked at. And then here, if we look at the last bit, so the last kilometers, the last meters of the lap, you see that um, Verstappen went full throttle the latest time at, at 2,977 meters, while uh, Alonso went full throttle at 2,990 meters. So that's 13 meters earlier, Verstappen managed to go on throttle. So he managed to carry much more speed through the last corner and actually gained that 0 0.08 second edge over uh, Alonso. So I hope this really explains to you how yeah, process mining and how looking at data through uh, process analytics allows you to get those insights to really understand those tiny inefficiencies and how differences can be made. And also your process in the end can be improved. Um, I think this is a good moment again for questions. I'm sure I've overwhelmed you with uh, with information. So maybe, uh, yeah, you want to ask some questions about uh, what we've seen so far. I'll give you a few seconds to either type it or raise your hand. What would be the happy flow? That's a very, very good question. Um, so let me first explain what a happy path is. So if we're talking about, uh, yeah, again, the, the morning routine, you have your ideal flow, you have your, uh, your desired process, and that's what we call the happy path. So actually the, the most efficient way the process can be running. And um, the thing here is the, 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 the differences between laps, between fastest laps at such a track, are so tiny that basically almost all processes already follow the happy flow. Uh, happy flow. The only difference is that um, yeah, the, the, the times between those activities can be optimized. So the happy flow would actually, if you just look at the entire process, would be this one. Uh, this is for Stoppen's lab. It's the most efficient run through the process. So we can consider this the happy flow. This is the desired path that has the most interesting, uh, most optimal uh, process flow. This is a very good question because that's not, uh, this is a rather special process in that sense. Um, how would Formula One teams implement this data into bringing upgrades to the car? Yeah, that's a very good one. And I think we're looking at the answer over here, uh, benchmarking. Uh, actually, a very popular use case of process mining is yeah, what I just mentioned, benchmarking. And uh, some of our customers also use process mining to, for example, implement changes in their IT system and monitor those changes. So let's say they release a change uh, in the middle of the month. They can benchmark the beginning of the month with the second part of the month to see how actually those changes uh, impacted their process. And the same then goes for, uh, let's say, bringing upgrades to the car, uh, Benjamin. So uh, yeah, let's say you have upgrades to the car, you have KPIs that basically describe the efficiency or how well those cars perform. Then um, yeah, you can benchmark it and see if actually the upgrades bring the desired effect. Good question. Uh, so I see a lot of questions coming in. Very nice. Uh, Sebastian, have you encountered any issue with the missing data during analysis or data from F1 TV or data from F1 TV are flaws in all cases? Um, not always, but I must say the data is quite uh, robust in that sense. Sometimes during rainy sessions or sessions with a lot of red flags or safety cars, the data is a bit yeah, more messy, but still at least representing more to happen. Um, in very few cases, there's uh, yeah, re really big issues where we don't have any available data. So um, I'd say it's uh, generally speaking quite reliable, except for some situations that uh, yeah, cause some 
complications. Do you know which process mining algorithm is used for this analysis? Um, actually, I would need to look that up, but it's a very good question. Ricardo, can we have a look at the transformations and data model? Um, if we have some extra time after these questions, I can definitely dive into that. I'm more than happy to share the data model with you, for example. Um, we did create it ourselves. Um, also, a uh, big shout out to my colleagues, Dennis and Noel, who are sitting in Apollox HQ. They've been doing uh, a lot of the dashboard building and data engineering for me to also support me with this webinar. So, and they've done an amazing job, so I'm very grateful for, for their help as well. Uh, but Ricardo, uh, yeah, if you have time, we dive into it. Otherwise, uh, I'll be, of course, more than happy to share the knowledge later with you as well. So uh, feel free to contact me directly. Um, Paolo, well, the most optimal could be a mix of other flows. I mean, getting sector one flow from Alonso instead of stop and so on. It's the platform aimed to kind of building the optimal flow, taking data from different labs slash drivers. Um, that is, in a way, that's definitely possible. Um, you can consider, for example, uh, correlating multiple processes, identifying which steps are the most optimal. And what you can then also do, there's a, for example, a feature in Solonis called the conformance checker, where you can really build your ideal process through a BPM model. You can then test uh, whether process flows or the cases are actually complying with that uh, theoretical optimal process flow. So indeed, uh, Paolo, you might not be the right thing to say that that the fastest process is the most optimal process. You can, of course, tweak some uh, some things to yeah, really define what your ideal process would be. And you can actually implement it in Solanus and then also continuously monitor that. Um, okay, excellent application of EMS in racing. Good to see process mining tool depict such intricate insights from a large volume of data. Analyzing business processes must be a breeze. Uh, trust me, it is. Of course, there's some uh, some complete, there's some challenges always, but um, Solon is a very very good tool for analyzing business processes. Are there any other APIs available than Fast F1? Question from Zeal. Yes, there's also the Ergast API. It's E R G A S T, and it basically um, has a lot of data that is not related to telemetry or car sensor data, but it's more about race results. So if you want to know, for example, who was the fastest driver during qualifying Monaco in 2061 uh, or 1961, actually, you can look it up via the Airgust API. Um, I'm going to answer two more questions um, and then we continue. Uri Tenzer, would you be able to do this analysis in real time to allow the driver to monitor its behavior during the lab? Actually, yes, Solonis uh, allows for continuous data integration. Um, the data is also during a session being streamed um, through the F1 APIs. You can actually listen to the data extracted and theoretically inserted in Solonis right away to get those insights. So it's 100% possible. The data is uh, yeah, available in a live format. Um, Art van der Poel, when analyzing a race, can you get any insight in effect of tire degradation? Yes, um, it is a complicated question because um, yeah, you always see during long stint that the pace the car becomes slower actually, uh, or you, you most often see that. So that is, for example, due to tire degradation, tire wear, so that yeah, the car can carry less speed through the corners, for example, and become slower. But also the car becomes faster because it loses fuel. It burns fuel and uh, yeah, loses uh, tens of kilos of weight. And in that sense, it's really hard to establish what loss in speed is actually due to tire degradation, um, but it's a whole different conversation. You can actually, yeah, see at least what, what the tire degradation was. And so, if you compare, for example, long runs that were done during FE2, then you can also see on average for Red Bull the medium tire yeah, degradates a bit slower than, for example, with the Ferrari. So those insights can be made or can be extracted, but there can also be other reasons that um, yeah cause that slower look at the, the cost the car becoming slower um i'm going to answer one more question did you do a similar analysis of the qualify session of 22 to see if sergio press crashed on purpose Ooh, that's a spicy one the spicy one 
Uh, it's a very good question. Uh, for the ones who don't know what happened there uh, last year, uh, right before entering the tunnel of Monaco, um, Serge Perez spun his car, and uh, it was during Q3, uh, cost the red flag, and the session was not going to be resumed, uh, meaning that he started ahead of Max Verstappen. And there has been, there has been a lot of uh, controversy around that. Um, there's some yeah, suggestions that it was done on purpose. I actually looked at the data, and uh, while I'm not going to draw like big conclusions here, uh, maybe you should look up the data yourself, but you see actually uh, Perez going on throttle unreasonably early. So if you go on throttle too early, your car causes to spin, and that's exactly what happened uh, during that lap. So yeah, if it was a mistake or intentional, it's of course not what we are able to say, but actually yeah, the data says that he applied the throttle earlier than he did before and also earlier than other drivers. Very spicy question, but a good one. Um, oh, there's one more comment. Press sets his watch wrong in his... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, Press indeed crashed a little bit too early in this uh, in, in this year's session because he actually crashed in the first five minutes of the entire qualifying session. So it was quite the, uh, the intense qualifying session. Um, let's quickly go back to the presentation. I want to summarize what we have just just have seen. Um, we saw that Alonso had a very strong first sector and was overall quicker through corners. That's the throughput time analysis that we just did. But then we also saw that Verstappen made the difference in sector three by carrying more momentum through corners. He was more confident on throttle. Um, there was more confidence breaking late. He was less percentage on the brake, and he was accelerating much earlier out of the final two corners, uh, getting that extra edge over um, Alonso. So that is in a nutshell what you've just seen through data. Um, I think it was quite the journey going from uh, what is process mining and maybe not even knowing what we can do with the uh, from one data to uh, getting these insights applied to a uh, actual Grand Prix qualifying session. So um, I'm sure it might have been overwhelming. Um, I'll also be sharing these resources afterwards. The recording will be available as well. So you can uh, yeah, sit down and maybe digest the information a bit slower as well. But I at least hope that you uh, found it very interesting. Um, process mining can help you understand and improve processes. Uh, if you want to learn more about it, if you're now interested in what it can bring to you for your, for example, businesses, but or you want to do your own type of analysis, or you want to do your Formula 1 analysis, yeah, we're also here to support you with that. I'll also be sharing contact details um, afterwards. So uh, more than happy to help out with any type of question. But yeah, maybe uh, what I'll do right now is instead of answering the questions one by one in the chat, I'll enable the microphone for everyone and we can spend the last 10 minutes um, maybe discussing uh, yeah, what other questions there are. I see one more question popping up while I be at the Salonis World Tour. Uh, yes, I'm going to Amsterdam and I'm going to London. So maybe see you there, Carlos. Are there any questions? If so, raise your hand and then uh, we can uh, discuss them. Or of course, if you don't want to speak out loud, um, yeah, feel free to add, add them in the chat. Thank you, Vika. Uh, are you able to infer other data from this, uh, for example, fuel usage throughout the lab? Um, it's not data that is there, but you can also uh, yeah, estimate, for example, what the fuel uh, uh, consumption has been during a lab. You can also then correct lab times for yeah, fuel usage. So we're getting fuel corrected labs. And uh, this is an analysis I've been doing here and there. Uh, it's possible, but it's quite complicated because again, you don't know what yeah, change in speed can be actually related to a uh, change uh, to um, fuel usage. Thank you, Mirko, for your nice words. Um, Mirko, actually, I've been doing a webinar about uh, Formula One data analysis with. And Mirko is uh, one of the largest Formula One data analysis accounts on uh, on Twitter at the moment. So uh, make sure to check him out as well. It's F1 data analysis. Uh, Paolo, sorry, yeah, go ahead. Do, do you still have time to show us the data model? I'm very interested. Um, yes, 
I'll be happy to show the data model. Um, so it's a quick peek in the background of Solonis right now. Uh, what we have here is a uh, data model. I'm hoping you can see it properly. So what we have here is uh, the case table. And the case table is the, the, the lab data. So each individual lab is a case. And the case key is basically the unique identifier of a lab. So in this case, it's the, the year, it's the event name. So 2023 Monaco, session name, so qualifying driver number and lab number. So for example, for Stappen's lab, let's say his 15th lab during the session was his poll lab. His poll lab would be 2023 Monaco qualifying 33, oh, sorry, number one for Stappen and then lab, uh, I think I said 21. 15. I don't know anymore, but in, at least that's the uh, that's going to be the case key. And then in here we insert all the activities, and activities are actually uh, yeah those those events like full throttle. So this case, so for this particular case key, full throttle was applied at this point of time. Uh, so that is uh, the case in the activity table. And then next to that we have a telemetry data, so we can basically relate that to the to the lab based on the driver number, the lab number, and session name. Uh, we have some weekend information. So um, yeah, the, the round number refers to yeah, the, the rounds in the calendar. So in this case, Monaco, and there was some details on when was it, where was it, like that type of information. And also we've been doing some custom engineering, uh, we've been altering the telemetry data a little bit, uh, which we also connected in the data model. So uh, you can see the core is basically these two case and activity table, and then everything around it is contextual data. I'm going to go into the chat one more time. Very nice. Uh, Martijn Ottens, thank you so much for the nice words. Um, Mark, that's my dad actually, and now he finally understands what I do on a day to day basis. It's also very nice uh, <laughs> after a while. Um, Paolo Fossimo seems to be a Python library, but it seems there is no official documentation about the 401 TV API. Uh, if you, for example, want to write a library using a different language, exactly. And that's the challenging thing here. Um, that's why the FOSF1 library is a blessing to have, um, basically tackles the entire API for us. Um, and yeah, that, that is the challenge that people have indeed. If you want to really work with the raw data, you'll need a lot of time and investment um, to really do that and to achieve that. But uh, yeah, it, it will require some uh, trial and error, I'm afraid. And can you predict the pit stop strategy using this data? Um, yes and no. Uh, there's a lot of factors, of course. Um, there's a lot of factors that determine whether uh, the driver will go into the pits to change for tires. There's a, the strategic component that yeah, is also a qualitative one, not a quantitative one, which you can, which you can do. You can, of course, understand tire degradation, measure tire degradation, and find the ideal crossover point where it will actually be faster to now dive into the pits, change tires, and continue the race on your new tires. But that, that is just one component of strategy, and there's a lot more to it. So, uh, okay, predict yes and no. Uh, there are uh, some indicators to support the decision, but there's always more to it, of course. Um, last question on the fuss of one question above. Um, let me think that the data are not really public. Who developed fuss one had some insights and trial error to do indeed. That's uh, that's very true. Uh, it, uh, I'm very very happy that we have the the, uh, the Python package at least because with that we can uh, do a lot of amazing stuff and also improve the Formula One experience for uh, the big fan base. Um, are there any other questions? I have a question. First of all, I want to thank you for such an interesting presentation. And going to question, if you had a possibility to cover more data from telemetry than those shared by F1 TV, which mm -hmm. inputs would that be? Some connected to tire temperature, angle of a steering wheel, yeah, and so uh, on? 
very good question. Uh, steering data would be very, very interesting because you can, with that, you can also understand, for example, how confident a driver is going through the corner. So if you see a lot of shaking, steering is compensating a bit more, for example, which uh, might indicate a, not an optimal lap. Uh, but also what I would really like to have um, is more frequent data because what we now have is four to five seconds, uh, four to five times per second, we do get the data, which sounds like a lot. But if we're talking about a car that moves with 300 kph towards a corner, um, it, you're actually missing some uh, insight. So I would like to have yeah, the data on a more frequent basis, even to really better be able to pinpoint where those inefficiencies are and also to better understand lap times. Uh, so steering data and more frequent data would be my answer. Thank you so much. Uh, well, and all for the rest, uh, very nice, uh, nice comments. Thank you all for the compliments. Uh, if there's no further questions, I think uh, it's also almost 12, so perfectly in time. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, it has been Apollo's biggest webinar so far, so I'm pretty proud of that in the first place. Also be very grateful for the, for the opportunity to share my personal passion, the things I've been working on and combine it with my, uh, my professional life. And last but not least, I would also, again, really like to thank uh, Lars, uh, sorry, uh, Noel and Dennis for their uh, contribution to this project. It, uh, they basically built this data model that we just showed us. Uh, definitely a massive help and uh, I'm very proud of them. So thank you very much. And uh, yeah, who knows, we'll talk soon and I'll send you the uh, yeah, resources afterwards as well. Have a good day. Bye-bye.